Hey everybody, I'm Eric Mueller, and welcome back to The Eric Mueller Show, a podcast where we explore what makes any successful person's inner clock tick. Today is a big day. I'm proud to be releasing the 25th episode of my podcast. I really hope you've been enjoying the show thus far. It's sure been such a blast producing it for you. To celebrate this milestone episode, I am interviewing a truly sensational guest. Derek Clifford is the founder and CEO of Elevate Equity a firm that partners with individuals and companies to purchase, improve, and operate multifamily apartment real estate. Derek is also the author of the best-selling new release book, Part-Time Real Estate Investing for Full-Time Professionals. In this episode, Derek will teach you why investing in real estate is probably the best thing you can do for your financial future and how to do it. Also listen closely when Derek and I talk about mindset. I think having the right mindset is so essential when chasing success. Happy 25th episode to The Eric Mueller Show. I can't wait for the next 25 and the next 125. Let's head on over to the interview. All right, so welcome back to The Eric Mueller Show. This is the podcast where we explore what makes any successful person's inner clock tick. Now, today I've got a really special guest here. A personal interest of mine is real estate investing. I haven't started yet, but I've got a man here named Derek Clifford. He's a CEO and founder of a company that does real estate investing. He's got a podcast that talks about this type of thing. He's written a book on it. Derek Clifford, welcome to the Eric Mueller Show, sir. Eric, it's an honor to be here. Happy to serve. Man, I'm excited. I... I mean, real estate investing is really something like I, I'm in traditional investment stocks, even, you know, own a fair amount of crypto, but I have not branched into real estate investing yet. So I really want to ask you why and how can people start investing in real estate while they're working full time like I am right now? Mm, good question. And I actually get this quite a bit, Eric, um, especially when I was back working in the in the full time world. I'm going to first give you a little bit of the benefits of why you would want to invest in real estate. So the first thing is lots of demand because right now we are short about 1.5 million housing units currently. And we're we're doing this recording in October or quarter four of 2021. Yeah. And right now um, there's 1.5 million units that need to be built or supplied somehow to keep up with the demand according to the, uh, the population dynamics that we're seeing in the country right now. So it's good to have a product that everyone wants. It means that if you buy it, prices go up. And in addition to that, you have a whole bunch of inflationary forces behind the government. Um, you know, So the government keeps printing money nowadays. And so inflation, when it goes up, you lock in your price with fixed debt. And then the value of the asset continues to increase because the debt is fixed, right? So you're, you're going to have an increasing asset while your debt behind it stays fixed and the demand is still there. And we anticipate a demand for the population growth, as long as, you know, nothing happens, knock on wood to the United States and the power and the allure of being in the U S compared to all the other countries in the world, Mm. we're going to see more migration. We're going to see more jobs. We're going to see more things here in the U S relative to the rest of the world happening. And so when you have that draw, you have a demand or you have a product that people want. So that's the main thing. The other thing that I really like about real estate and why people should consider investing in it is that there is five ways, actually really six ways that you make money investing in real estate that you don't get through paper assets or you get through you know, working, uh, trading your time for money. Number one is appreciation. So you buy a property and then of course it appreciates, right? That's pretty straightforward. Everyone understands that. Right. Number two is cash flow. If you buy a rental property and it cash flows, if you pay the expenses and the debt, any money that's left over for you is your income. So that's good. That's cash flow. Number three is debt pay down. You have someone else paying down a mortgage on your behalf, right? So that's pretty cool. They're building equity for you just for you holding the property. Right. Number four is equity capture. In no other kind of economic space or any kind of like asset space, could you buy a stock that's worth a dollar for 80 cents? But in real estate, if you can find a distressed asset, right, that needs some work to it, the sellers will be willing to sell for a little bit of a discount. So there's a way that you can kind of negotiate that equity capture where you come in, 
you bring a painting crew with you. And because the seller of the property didn't want to do the paint or anything, they're giving you extra money in the terms of a lower purchase price. But you can come in there and they'll give you a 10% drop in purchase price. And you can bring you or your painters in there and spend 5,000 bucks to get the whole house painted. And you've just created that difference between $5,000 that it costs you to, put, to get it painted and then $10,000 that the owner gave you because they didn't want to paint. Does that make sure. sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then the fifth and most important thing, especially for medical professionals and for any professionals is depreciation, the tax benefits. Because when you own real estate, as long as you set yourself up correctly in a tax structure, you will be in a position to be able to write off more than the income you're making on your property. So while you're collecting income on your property, you're actually taking depreciation that offsets your income that you have on your active work. So just to, just to recap all this, Eric, right? Yeah. You are creating income for yourself that comes in from a rental property, but at the same time, you're reporting to the IRS that you're losing money, which means your tax burden goes down because of depreciation. Sure. So yeah. those are the two reasons why you should invest in real estate. And I think the other half is how, right? You said you said how to more easily, how to easily invest into it, right? As busy, mm -hmm. busy professionals. So there's a couple of ways. It depends on what your personality is. If you like to be hands-on and you have the time and the aptitude and the interest to go after things and do things on your own, you could go and buy single family houses in a cheap market if you're living in an expensive market. And you can put a team together and you can rehab a property and you can buy one and you know get that huge price discount, rehab it yourself, and then get a property manager to collect rents. And you could do that yourself. But the more easily, the more easier way that I would recommend that your busy professional audience could go is to partner with folks. There's a lot of different ways you can partner with it. There's syndications, which is basically a fancy name for taking a whole bunch of people's monies and putting it together for a big apartment complex. Like, you know, you have uh, for a $10 million apartment complex, you need $3 million to close on it because you got to come up with the down payment and then there's closing costs and there's a rehab amount, a rehab budget usually uh, whenever you buy a $10 million complex. So of that $3 million, if one person brings 300K to the table, and goes into that apartment investment, well, then they own 10% of the equity of the whole building. That's that's how the syndication thing works. Right. Right. So whatever amount you bring to the cash requirement up front, that's your ownership percentage after you pay someone else to help do all the sweat equity. They're doing all the work. So you're not doing any of the work. You're just bringing capital to the table and you have the SEC to protect you. And then you have an operating partner who also has equity alongside of you who's earned that because their portion to contribute into the investment is to do all the work for the property, to manage the property manager and to get the returns that are in the business plan, okay? And the, only, the other way that you could think about doing something like this is find someone you trust who would do a joint venture with you. So let's say that you find someone um, who is in a, a market like Indianapolis, it ha happens to be my market. And if you're in the Indianapolis market, right, maybe there's a, a 16 unit apartment building where this person has a track record working in that market and you can be the capital partner there and just give the person the cash to close. And you create a document that makes you the owner of 90% or 85% or 80% of the property. And your only role was to bring cash and you leverage the relationship with the person that you know can do well in that market. And then they earn their equity by running the operation for you. So again, three ways to get into it. One is you can do it actively yourself by starting in single families and moving up into multifamily. You can do syndications and put 50K, 30K in a whole bunch of different syndications with different operators across the whole country to diversify yourself. Or you can find someone and joint venture with them on smaller multifamily apartment complexes and be the only cash partner there, or maybe you and some other, some one other person can be the cash partner with one or two operating partners to get a small lean team in to make the returns for you work. So hopefully that was helpful for you. I hope it wasn't too long of an answer. <laughs> no, that, I mean, that's an awesome answer. I, it totally and fully answered each part of the question. And I think, you know, my mind is just kind of thinking of who, who might I go to or which, you know, which friend or which family member, or which, you know, even stranger that, you know, that I'm connected with on LinkedIn, could I reach out to you to do that? And 
you, you mentioned before this interview, Derek, that, that you and your wife accidentally entered into real estate investing. So I, yeah. I sense a story there. I'm, would you mind expanding on that? Maybe that might give some clarity as far as like how I can jump in. Sure. Yeah. So I don't recommend taking this route, um, okay. but this is, this is what happened. Um, so my, my wife, I, I come from a, a family where everyone works corporate jobs, right? So I had no real estate investing experience up until about seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, and my wife, her family had bought a property for her for grad school in Washington state. And so she, um, they got this condo and they, they spent $250,000 for it. Unfortunately, the time that they bought it was May of 2008. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Not so, <ideal>. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as they held the property, they watched the equity vanish um, down to about 80 80K or $80,000, $90,000. And so they were very far underwater on this property. And even by the time she had graduated in 2012 or 2013 ish timeframe, um, the property value had not recovered enough for it to make sense to sell. So we we had to hold this thing, even though she had been offered a um, uh, a residency in the Bay Area in Northern California. So mm -hmm. we had to leave the property and we didn't have the, the check to be able to cover it, right? So we were kind of stuck with this property. The whole plan was, Eric, is that, you know, with all this appreciation going on, the plan was for her to buy the property. The property would appreciate. And then when she, when she left, when she would leaves the, um, when she, when she graduates, she was going to sell the property and then use that to pay off the student loan debt. That was, that was the plan. Yeah. But everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Right. <laughs> and this is, this is exactly what happened here. So we were kind of stuck with this property. I started dating my wife back in 2011 or 2012. And so, you know, we, we, we watched this happen and she had to move down to the Northern California. We had no other choice. We couldn't let it go. So we had to become landlords by default. So basically what we did is we found some grad students, right. Who were right behind her in a freshman class um, and posted up notices on, you know, on campus and said, Hey, you know, we're, we're looking for responsible grad students to move into this place and pay us rent of like 1250 a month or something like that. And as we got them in there and Sophie and I, and my wife, we were driving down from Northern, from, from Washington down to Northern California. Um, we started collecting this mailbox money. We noticed that like after all of the mortgage payments and the HOAs and everything, we were collecting like an income of like 300 bucks a month yeah. off this thing. And it got my engineering brain because that's, that's my background as I used to be an engineer. Um, it got my, my brain moving and it's like, man, if this happened to us on accident, what would happen if we actually did this on purpose? And so that question really started motivating me to learn as much as I could about real estate investing. So, you know, I started reaching out um, to people that I knew that did do rental properties and I found bigger pockets online, um, huge forum of like, you know, like-minded individuals who ask a bunch of questions and all the, all the forums are online for everyone to read. Um, and there's podcasts and books. And so we really took our time learning how to invest in real estate deliberately. And everything just kind of took off from there at that point. You know, we, we, we were really intentional about it. We started meeting up with a whole bunch of folks locally who were investing out of state because California is expensive. Like I actually had um, seven rental properties under my name before I bought my own private residence in California. That's how, that's how crazy it is over in the Bay Area. <laughs> so um so yeah, that's, that's kind of our story. That's how we got started. Yeah. Gosh, what a story. I mean, that to, to like, just kind of stumble into what would end up being something that you're interested in and is profitable and, you know, became a passion for you to a continue doing it, but then B, you know, you're teaching others how to do it. So you're paying it forward. So, I mean, I just think it was meant to be, in other words, is what I'm thinking here, Derek. It is, it is. And it's very, I feel so fortunate to be able to live in a country where I can have that passion expressed. That's what Warren Buffett said. He said, you know, he's, he tap dances into work every day. Right. And, right. but if he was born in a country like in Russia, or if he was born in, you know, India, or if he was born in, in Africa or something, there would be no way that these talents would be able to be expressed. So I wake up every day with a sense of gratitude that I love what I do. Um, even though I stumbled into it, it took me some time to find it. But once I did, I kind of latched on and, and we've been seeing great success with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Derek, that, you know, that sentiment there really ties in, I think with, with the core of what my podcast aims to do. And that is explore 
what makes any successful person's dinner clock tick. So, I mean, if you were, if you were to just bring it down to either one word, one phrase, couple phrases, what is that driving force that keeps your inner clock ticking towards success? Hmm. I would say it's mindset. Mindset. Okay. Um, I, I think that for me, like being, being aware of your surroundings um, and by having a mindset. So here, here's my theory on this, Eric. I think that um, whatever mindset we are, if you, if you come into the world or if you develop in a seven figure mindset, it's just a matter of time before the outside world catches up with you and yeah. seven figures become, comes your world. If sure. you have an eight figure mindset, then it's, that's also a matter of time. It may take a little bit longer, but as long as you can be consistent and you have the mindset to stick with it, because the, the mindset piece drives everything that we do, especially as entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. If the mindset's there, you're going to have consistency because your, your mind is just saying you've got to be consistent because you're obsessed or you're driven by this certain thing that you do. Right. Right. And so if you have a five figure mindset, then it won't take much time before your world starts manifesting in that direction also. So I think that if you can keep your mind sharp by having these types of conversations, by asking the questions, right? And honing that mindset as to where you want to be, where you really want to be and what you're willing to give up to and, and sacrifice to be where you want to be. We are so grateful to be here in the United States, Eric. Like, you know, we have... So many opportunities here. You can really do whatever it is that you want to if you put the work in and you go about it in an intelligent way. If you, if you network with the right people, you take advantage of the resources that are available for you, you really can do it as long as the mindset piece and the, the, the stick to itness sticks around. Sure. Yeah. Where, where my mind goes to this is a book that I am in the process of reading. It's taken me longer than it should have, but it's called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. You may have heard of yeah. that book, Derek. Excellent. I mean, that's hitting, hitting the nail on the head with that as far as the mindset piece, because that book goes through and, and walks you through just exactly how to train your mind. Just like you said, if you have the mindset of seven, eight figures in there, like you, you're going to, you're going to bring that into existence. Your, your mind can be, a, you know, in front of your physical actions, so to speak. So if you're mentally there, Eventually, your body's going to believe that so much in its core that it's going to physically get you there. It's kind of how the book says it. And it's it's very inspiring read. So anybody that's that's interested in that, I mean, give give that a read for sure. Um, I'll tag a link to it in the show notes here. But but yeah, I mean, yeah, Derek, that, I mean, I appreciate you, you bringing that up because that's something that I definitely believe in. And I think a lot of people listening probably resonate with that as well. They do. And, and you know, sometimes it takes you listening to it a few times and hearing someone else say it in a different way for it to really stick with you. because until like you may hear this intellectually, but until you actually grok it, like until you actually, <laughs> you really like understand it to the core because you've seen it happen or you've, you've you, like, you're your own case study, you know, like you've seen this happen before with your own experience, you're not going to be able to talk confidently to it and be able to tell others about it. So I, I and, and I'm only saying that to your audience, because eventually you get to a point where you will realize this. I just hope that whoever you are listening out there, that you get that sooner rather than later, because it's, it's absolutely essential for your success. Yeah. Yeah. And another thought I have here, Derek, and, and this is, you know, something that definitely can ties into real estate investing as far as, you know, jumping in when you have a full-time job, let's say, but is there anything you think that like, what is one thing that holds people back from success or taking action? Like what, what kind of keeps them paralyzed, so to speak in their own world without, you know, jumping in? Mm, yeah. I'll, I'll, let me share a story with you real quick. Yeah, um, for sure. So when I first started investing in real estate, like I, you know, I knew that real estate was right for me because we had a, an example that worked. We had that property up in Washington state that was performing well, you know, without us having to do too much work. But, um, at the same time, when we went to purposefully try to expand and maybe some of your listeners, uh, may get this, get in this, in this mode, um, they, they, they may have a lot of dedication. They may have the focus, they may have the drive but maybe there's a sense of analysis paralysis. That's what happened to me Yeah, where I learned so much that I thought that I could optimize my result. And so I never took any action. So to answer your question, it's taking action, but in order to really be more practical and helpful to your listeners, 
I think that if analysis paralysis is something that you're struggling with, right, in, in the form of taking action, as soon as I shifted my mindset away from trying to make a million bucks or hit a home run straight from the get-go to A, how do I protect my downside? And B, how can I learn as much as possible? That's when action started happening. Sure. I knew that knowledge was really the nugget that you needed to start building and accruing. Money is going to come. If you're worried about passive income, that will come. And, and it will eventually come out. That's, that's what knowledge does. Like when you have knowledge and you make informed decisions and you don't make mistakes, especially on the small scale, right? Make your mistakes on the small scale. So shift your, your thinking around from not trying to hit a home run straight from the beginning, but trying to learn something that you can use for the next property or for the next deal, because you're going to learn so much things. You're going to get, get answers to questions you never even knew you should know you should ask. Yeah. And it's going to build your confidence. And so I'm all about the learning, the personal growth to help curb your behavior, to make this stuff happen over the intellectual knowledge. And, you know, I come from a background where college educated, I got a master's degree. So I think I'm in good company here with you in the audience, Yeah, but I tend to overanalyze things and I tend to try to come at this from the exact right precision angle, but that's just not the way that real business works. And so I think that, you know, adjusting things, learning things, having a little bit of courage and taking calculated risks, that's what's really going to move the needle. And it may not be comfortable for you to hear, but that's truly what starts to get results is getting that, getting that calculated risk out there and standing behind it and taking responsibility and protecting your downside, right? Making an informed decision and making those risks and taking that action. Yeah. And this, it keeps coming back. I had a guest on earlier in, in the year here, Ben Whiting. He's a magician and a speaker and a performer. And something he said was that action trumps planning. So he's like, you know, you could sit and plan something all day long, but if you don't take action, it's not going to amount to anything. So I think that really ties in perfectly with, with what you're saying here. I mean, you, at some point you can learn, you can study, you can analyze, but at some point you just got to thrust yourself in there and find out if that's the right fit for you. And, and you might fail. I mean, I'm sure, you know, throughout your career as a real estate investor, you probably had some mistakes along the way, you know, not including that 2008 experience. Oh, but, yeah. I mean, what you know, what's an example of a mistake you've had, Derek? Yeah. So um, just, to, just to tie that in exactly, and then I'll jump into a mistake real quick. But yeah. one of the books that I really thought was really influential for me was a book called The Slight Edge. Okay. Um, by, I forgot his first name, but I think his, his last name was Olson. It's either Jeff Olson or Josh Olson. I can't remember exactly, but... Um, the Slight Edge was a fantastic book. And in there, he had an analogy where um, if you're going to go on a flight from Los Angeles to Boston or to New York, right? The pilots don't just get their angle set up straight from Los Angeles when they're leaving the airport and heading over to Boston. There's always these little adjustments, right? You have the direct course plotted, but you always have to have these micro adjustments when you're going on your journey. Yeah. And so- That's incredible. That's something that I would I would recommend that people think about in terms of a in terms of an analogy for your journey, right? Your journey from Los Angeles to New York, which is from point A to B, or from where you are now to where you want to be. And as you're going on this journey, make sure that your plane the plane is pointed in the right direction. So you start taking action towards the place that you think you want to go, but be willing to actually move forward. And even if you do make a mistake, it's okay. You'll find a way to correct yourself and get yourself back on course. It's all about staying moving. And that goes back also to my comment before about being action oriented and continuing to move forward and not being paralyzed. Right. So anyway, I think your, your question was what, what mistakes have I found along the way? Right. Yeah, no. And I do appreciate that statement too. I mean, I'll, I'll tag that the slight edge book in the show notes. Cause I think that is a great point, a great read um, to yeah. have on the list there, but yeah. Yeah. If you have, I mean, even yeah. just like one mistake in your mind, I think that'd be awesome to hear about. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot, but <laughs> the, <laughs> one that, uh, the one that comes to my mind, um, the one that comes to mind right away is basically, uh, jumping in, in a partnership that shouldn't have been a partnership. Um, okay. and, uh, having that go bad. And I took too much trust in what one of my coworkers was saying that bringing in this external partner was going to be good. Cause you know, there was four of us and I know I brought in one other person. And then the, uh, the second person I knew well, 
from work. And then he brought in another partner. And it turns out that that other person, I didn't know him well, but him and I were like the majority equity owners on this deal. Ah, uh, okay. And um, it just didn't, it didn't work out well. Like there was a lot of discussions and disagreements and basically, you know, to make a long story short, we had a, a property that we had bought. Um, believe it or not, we bought 18 units in Indianapolis in 2018 for about $350,000 cash, which, sure. <laughs> which is crazy. That's really cheap um, yeah. because there's some, some places where you, that's an entire house, you know, in, in the country. Mm-hmm. And in some cases it's half of a house, right? So um, so we, we got into this deal and he had a different philosophy and I didn't know that he had a different way of like of running. I'm more by the books and more uh, democratic. I like to talk with the group before making decisions. And then we have another partner that's on there that doesn't like to operate that way. That's more, you know, kind of, um, fly by night, kind of shoot from the hip kind of thing. And then, and then answer questions later. Mm-hmm. And he basically ended up firing some of our property managers and we had no more property managers left. So we had this property in Indiana with no property manager and all oh four gosh. of us partners in California. Oh, wow. And we're, we're, <laughs> trying to, we're trying to get the tenants out so we can turn the units around, right? In construction. And then, you know, because of this, this partner dynamic and because of, we didn't, we lost all of our contacts out there. We started hiring people on the street you know, to help get these units turned and get the construction going because we lost all of my connections, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up like losing money because there were contractors out there that were taking photos of other properties that they were rehabbing and sending it to us saying that that was their progress on our property. Oh my goodness. And they were stealing (laughs) our materials. They were like basically buying, like we were sending money for materials and then they were using that to, to paint and to, you know, rehab other clients' properties. And then they were taking, they were charging us both for the materials and then they would pocket the difference. Right. So it's like (laughs) basic, basic things that should not have happened because I made a mistrust and over trusted someone without doing my due diligence on the person that I'm getting into a partnership with. Sure. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a powerful thought. I think knowing who you're getting into business with, I think that's for anybody listening that has desires to do entrepreneurial type endeavors or you know, small business, medium sized business, what have you, you know, to know who you're getting in business with is, is so essential. And sometimes, I mean, it's, you don't know, sometimes it's tough to really know until you found out it's too late. It's really funny, Eric, like, you know, listening to myself, tell that story, it almost seems like so basic. Like this is, <laughs> this is, this is like, you know, this is ABCs. This is like the very first thing that you should know. And and most people intuitively grasp it. Mm-hmm. It's just that, you know, it was something that um, I want to, I want to bring to you and your listeners that it is not something to overlook. Yeah. Um, you do not want to take this, this part lightly, lightly at all. Yeah, no, that's a great thought. I mean, I think a lot of people that, that, you know, have desires to start companies. I think that's probably one of the first things they think about if, unless they're independently wealthy to start, you know, you probably need someone else or a few other people to, to bootstrap you, to get you off the ground. Um, unless you have a really unique idea that venture capital just can't turn away from. But yeah, I think, I mean, that's definitely getting my, my head spinning as far as, I mean, I have a, you know, pretty short list of people that I know I would trust going into business with, but outside of that, you know, it's, it's kind of uncertain. Yep. And, and that's, that's kind of the world that we face. Right. And that's why networking and building up your contacts in the space that you want to go Mm -hmm. and having the mindset and the consistency to eventually, you know, seek out those people and be curious that's what's going to save you. You know, the, the bigger your network is, the more resources you're going to have. And then the more resources you're going to have, the more options you're going to have. And the more options they, that you have, the more opportunities you get. And the more opportunities you get, the more wealthier you're going to be. And yeah. so it all kind of starts with that network. It's kind of like this chain reaction um, where you can't help, but as long as you're curious and helpful and want to add value to people, it's just a matter of time before you end up, you know, becoming um, a passive wealth machine basically. Yeah. 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 And I mean, so, I mean, let's just take your journey for example here. So, I mean, you are now, you know, established in real estate investing. You have left your, your full-time, you know, job as of this August. So congratulations to you on that. Thank you. Um, you know, kind of move into your entrepreneurship full-time, but you've also have, you know, you've had some side hustles, so to speak. Real estate investing was a side hustle at one point, but you know, you also have a, a podcast, Elevate Your Equity. So you're, you're doing that. You, you authored a book, you know, about real estate investing as a full-time worker. So, I mean, you've had a lot of moving pieces along the way. So I'm just, I, I really want to kind of just figure out 
how do you manage, how do you balance that? How do you figure out where to put your time? You know, how, how might you write a book if it's your goal to write a book in a year? I mean, how, how might someone do that? Yeah. You know, again, it kind of comes back to the, the I, I always go back to the mindset piece because wherever your mind is, that's going to determine what your output's going to be. If something is important to you, it's going to be on your calendar. And of course, you know, what precludes that is having a strong mindset to be able to put it on the calendar and having the discipline to follow through with that time block. So the way I was able to do it, Eric, was I basically had a consistent time every day for four years, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's the time where I went into the office before everyone else started rolling in. And that was my real estate time. I did that every day, Monday through Friday for four years. And I went in there to do it, even if I didn't have a plan, right? Even if I, even if I didn't know what else to do, I would consistently go in there at 7 a.m. and put a plan together during that time. So that's where the mindset piece comes in. It's like, if, you, if you're going to be consistent about this and you're not driven, you know, you're going to be tempted to think, oh, well, I don't have a plan for what I'm going to do for seven a, from 7 a.m. to 8. So I'm just going to sleep in and I'll, I'll roll into the office at the normal time. No, mm-hmm. that's not how it works. If you force yourself to follow that plan, you're going to be sitting there either bored or you're going to find something to do with your time for either that block of time or for the rest of the week. So that's one thing that I highly recommend for people. And I know that a lot of your listeners don't have the time, but it doesn't have to be an, an extensive block. It doesn't have to be you know, an hour. It can be 30 minutes. It can be 15 minutes, but it should be something that's regular and in a place where you can be uninterrupted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And basically doing that repeatedly. So that's kind of a tip for me. Sure. No, that's, that's a great tip. It, it, it kind of echoes some, you know, previous guests of the show have, have shared that same sentiment. And, and for me, I know, I mean, it's, it's putting that in action is so much more difficult than it sounds. I, I don't know if you felt that way, but for me, I mean, I come from a distance running background. I've, you know, yeah. as a coll- collegiate athlete where you're putting in time in every day and you've got a good core group of guys that you're doing that with. Mm-hmm. When you're, when you're doing it solo, I mean, I've been training for half marathons for the last, you know, six, seven years now, it gets tougher. I mean, it's easier to fall off if you don't have someone to keep you accountable. And so I think slotting time into, you know, work on writing or, you know, just sit down and distraction free, put your phone down, you know, research, real estate investing. I think I know yeah. for me, I mean, people listening, I'm sure it sounds, it's, I'm sure it sounds easy, but I, I just know from experience that it is tough to block that time unless you're really intentional about it. Yes. And one thing I would, I would recommend another resource that, that I'd recommend to you and the listeners is a book called Atomic Habits. Have okay. you, have you heard of this? Absolutely. have heard of it. Haven't read it yet, but it's, it's on my list. Okay. One of the things I don't mean to spoil it for you, but one of the things that's in there that's super yeah. powerful is habit chaining. So eventually you, you'll start to realize that like, um, there's, there's a book called the power of habit by Charles Duhigg. And he talks more about the psychology and what, what, happens in your brain with habits. Like there's a a cue, a routine and a reward that happens, right? That's, that's, and that's basically the gist of that book. And he goes into how each of that works and, and why it's important and kind of some stories and anecdotes around it. But in atomic habits, what James clear, the author talks about is that if you, if you design your habits so that when you start one, it's a chain reaction of the others, you can, you can really accelerate your success. And so how this ties into what we were just talking about is that you can build your 15 minute or your 30 minute time block into your morning routine as something that you just do. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like, you know, um, I've, uh, there's also another book called uh, miracle morning, which is something I highly recommend for almost everyone that's in the entrepreneurial world. And you can start your day by doing some meditation, some exercising, some reading or whatever it is that you want to do, especially it's in the miracle morning and then chain the habits together. So just make it part of your morning routine, like do your meditation, then your exercise, and then your reading, and mm-hmm. then put in a 30 minute slot straight for your, um, for your, your real estate focus time or your entrepreneurial endeavor focus time. Right. Sure. And block that out of your calendar every single day and do it the first thing in the morning so that that way it's done, checked off your list and you can rest easy for the rest of the day. You've done your effort and you can, you can take comfort in the fact that you've moved and made progress in your business while you're working a full-time job. Yeah, man, that's, that's really powerful. And, and you're setting the tone for the day. Like you're, you're going to feel good. It's like when you get up and get your workout done at the first thing in the morning, you just, it sets the tone for the whole day. You feel like 
hey, I checked this off. Like, you know, I don't have to worry about it for the rest of the day. A hundred percent. Yep. Man, that's awesome. And that confidence, that confidence carries through. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why every time I really doubled down on this, like I ended up getting a promotion at work <laughs> because oh. <laughs> um, I felt more confident about my day, you know, and about myself. And so, you know, whenever you drive deep into this, it's like external things start forming for you. You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of un- unexpected. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, Derek, I, I got one more question for you, man. And then we'll, we'll wrap this up. We'll kind of just tie the knot in the interview, so to speak. So a core focus of my show, find out what makes people tick, what keeps them driven towards success. Look at, you know, highly successful individuals in a variety of fields, but all of them typically define success a little bit differently. So I'm interested to hear your take on what success is to you. And you can tie numbers to it, metrics if you want to. Or just generally speaking, what at the end of the day, how do you know that you've been successful in your life? Yes. Comes down to one word with three supporting ideas behind it, which is freedom, essentially. Sure. I like to talk about time freedom, location freedom, and financial freedom. Those are the three the three things that make me tick. Because we have a vision. My my wife and I, like we, you know, we're working towards this this vision of being able to do so many things. Like we want to, in the realm of giving back, we want to be able to live off of 10% of our income and give 90% of it away eventually. That's what we're working towards. That's awesome. But having the financial freedom, right? To be able to choose the life that we want to, having the time freedom to be able to decide what to do with our day and design our ideal day and live it. Yeah. And the locational freedom to be able to do it from any place that we choose which we're already doing right now. That's one of the reasons why I had to leave my full-time job is that I had to get the time freedom and the location freedom. We're still working on financial at this point. Um, We're getting close and closer to it every single day. But having those two degrees of freedom of the three degrees is basically allowing, allowing me to step into the abundant life right now. Yeah. And by stepping into the abundant life right now, um, we're living closer to our dream and it just becomes part of who we are. So I guess that's a long roundabout way of saying it's freedom, but there's different types of freedom and we're just trying to maximize as many degrees of that freedom as we can. Yeah. So, so you would say, and I know from re- reading your one sheet before the interview, those three aspects. So you say you've, you've unlocked two of the three. So you've got time and location right now and you're still working towards financial. Is that right? That's correct, sir. That's awesome. I, and that's exactly, I, other people that are listening to the show here, you might recall one of my guests, John Lee Dumas, another, you know, entrepreneurs on fire is his podcast. He's a host of that pretty much exactly his answer for success as well. So he's like, if you can do what you want to do, where you want to do it with who you want to do it with at each and every day, if you're checking out, checking each of those blocks off each day, that's success to him. So I think, I mean, Derek, your definition with John Lee Dumas is perfectly aligned. And I mean, John is a very successful guy as are yourself. So, I mean, clearly these these two are doing something right. So everybody listening, I mean, I, I think working towards that is probably a good idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. I think this sounds like a very smart individual. I probably need to reach out. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneurs on Fire. He's do. He's definitely uh, He's definitely a podcast, uh, a podcast to look up to for sure. Sounds but, good. Uh, well, Derek, man, thank you so much for spending the time. Had so much fun talking about real estate with you and I will tag everything in the show notes. So anybody that's interested in, in reaching out to Derek, um, you can access his podcast, his book, uh, website, learn about his company. And yeah, I mean, I'm excited to follow your journey, man. I, I can't wait until that day arrives where you can live off that 10% and give the 90 away. I think that's that's such a such a inspirational thing to, to share. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I really appreciate you having me on the show and um, just excited and jazzed up to help as many people as I can. So thanks again for your time and letting me come on. Absolutely, man. You have a great day. Thank you. You too.